Good evening, everybody. My name is Christopher Coker. I am director of LSE Ideas, which is the think tank, foreign policy think tank of the London School of Economics. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and last in a series of lectures called Empires Past and Present. Uh, we call them Engelsberg Lectures. Uh, these, this is a, a country home of the Axon Johnson family. And these lectures are brought to us by the generosity uh, financial generosity of the Axon Johnson Foundation. Our speaker today is familiar to many of you who've watched his previous uh, three lectures, I'm sure. Arnie Westat, uh, an internationally renowned uh, historian of the Cold War in China, now based at Yale, formerly at my own institution, the LSE, and, uh, and shortly after that at Harvard, and author of, uh, of many books that I won't enumerate, but he's won prizes for them, including the very prestigious Bancroft Prize. And we will be, he will be looking at uh, empires uh, no longer past, but empires present and empires perhaps future. And I remember being told by a well-renowned uh, columnist from the International Herald Tribune, William Pfaff, alas, no longer with us, that he'd written an, uh, an article on empire in foreign affairs in 1993. It was about why Africa should be recolonized. Uh, and only then, he said, would it be spared the cycle of war and genocide and political oppression that had led it to being called by The Economist magazine in a very famous uh, title, The Hopeless Continent. Now, the reason I mention that is that Faf told me that the editor of Foreign Affairs, which there was then, probably still is, the most prestigious international relations journal, certainly read by more policymakers than any other, had not received a single letter from the readership compared with the massive uh, influx of letters about Samuel Huntington's famous article written in the same year as Fast's on the clash of civilizations. And of course, before that, the famous letter by George Kennan, the X letter that was a primary landmark in the Cold War. Faf took this to be a sign that we were permanently out of the empire business, that no one even took his proposal seriously about recolonization. It could also be taken as a sign that we have rebranded empire, that it is uh, postmodern, to use a famous uh, phrase, or perhaps invisible, or perhaps in the case of my own country, the United Kingdom, that we like being part of uh, the American empire, about which Arnie will be speaking in just a moment, an empire by invitation. Arnie, as your countryman Gert uh, Lundschert famously called it. And of course, there are other possible empires in the making, a Chinese empire, a Russian Empire, Russian emphasis on the near abroad, the old Soviet space. But anyway, without further ado, um, Arnie, I will uh, ask you to uh, begin your lecture. I just tell people that there will be a question and answer session uh, after Arnie has spoken. Please post up your questions uh, as you think of them, rather than keep them for the end, and I shall keep a note of them. And there will also be a podcast uh, of this lecture that will be posted up afterwards. But Arnie, over to you. Thank you very much, Christopher. It, it's interesting to see, in terms of your uh, your your introduction, how significant concepts of empire always seems to be. Whenever we need to make some kind of decision about the future, in very different ways, people tend to hark back to that imperial past. Uh, often in ways, as I will explain later on today, that are problematic, but also in ways, hopefully, and this is one of the aims of this particular presentation, that would be better informed than many of the decisions that we made in the past. Because the most dangerous thing we can do with empires, uh, past and present, is to, is to ignore them. So let me start again by, by saying, since this is the last lecture in this series, what an honor it is for me to serve as the Engelsberg professor at LSE this year. It has not been the year that I had hoped for. Uh, I don't think it has been the year that the LSE had hoped for in terms of what we have been able to do. Um, I would have so much rather given this lecture uh, in the old theater, um, being able to see the people I'm speaking to and not least be able to interact over a point at the White Horse afterwards. But that will have to be for later. Now we have to concentrate on the, on the matter at hand um, let me say just before I turn to that, what a pleasure it is again to be chaired by Professor Koke. Christopher Koke and I worked together for many years as colleagues at LSE, and it's wonderful that he is now uh, in charge of, of running LSE ideas, which I think, not just because I was involved in setting it up, but in more general terms as well, is, is a prime 
outfit in terms of helping us to understand the impact that the post has on the present in terms of international affairs. So in this final lecture, um, I'm going to look at the situation today and how we have arrived at the position that we are in at the, at the moment. As you will remember in the first lecture, we looked at concepts of empire and imperialism, and we learned a bit about anti-imperial resistance in its various forms and how that was set up. And in the second lecture, we learned a great deal uh, about issues connected to world empires around 1800. I went into some depth in terms of explaining that origin. Um, and I explained also how the Europe-centered imperialisms began to take hold over other kinds of imperialisms that had existed in the past and how the world was transformed as a result. And in the third lecture, the last one before today, we looked at the world around 1900, um, still a world of empires, but rapidly changing. Uh, there was more resistance against empire, um, more change from within, uh, new forms of imperialism that highlighted progress and improvement over conquest and exploitation, though often in ways that were as oppressive and as bloody as what had gone before. Race and racism became more significant in terms of how empires constituted themselves. And much of that was connected to an ongoing debate, which we will pick up again in the lecture today about what Europeans often referred to as standards of civilization, which at least in my reading of this is another way of emphasizing race, that there were certain people who could govern themselves, who could run their own states, and there were others who were not capable of doing so. Um, and that was very much uh, distinguished, uh, differentiated by the color of their skin. So what happened around 1900 is really important for looking forward in terms of what we are seeing today. And uh, one of the arguments that I'm going to make in this lecture is that we are much closer to that world of empires than we often think uh, that we are. Think, for instance, about the significance that many of the discussions today have with regard to forms of governance. Uh, a lot of this, in, particularly in terms of how new states have been set up for the past two or three generations, link back to the expansion of democratic institutions in settler colonies in the late 19th century, particularly English-speaking settler colonies. Um, and that discussion about constitution making that was often connected to this particular form of settler colonialism also engendered the discussion about rights about, among indigenous peoples, um, for whom, of course, imperialism had meant the opposite, had meant a reduction in rights. So much of the fascination, which I will return to later on, with state building, with State, states' uh, rights within an international system, and uh, maybe in particular, uh, the development of constitutions go back to that particular uh, period. So around 1900, what we found was that traditional concepts of empire were undermined by the holding up of two new possibilities and holding up by the Europeans and by European offshoots, the Americans and, and the Russians. The first one was democracy within empire, which a number of people argued ought to be the ultimate aim, uh, that everyone within an empire would participate in one way or another within democratic institutions. And the second one, uh, a very different form of presentation, was um, an evolution towards independence, towards a different kind of states. Um, breaking up the empires, emphasizing new forms of state building. And from this, it's very clear that whatever kind of empire would emerge in the 20th century, it would have to be very different, both in terms of its framework and in terms of its legitimation from what had become uh, the standard uh, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century and before. 
even more important, I think, for what we are dealing with today is that the argument about empire being there for progress and improvement opened up in a very direct way um, for the primacy of totalizing ideologies in the 20th century. Communism and the universalization of forms of liberal capitalism, very often connected uh, in terms of the Cold War to, to the Soviet Union and the United States. And I think the primacy of this, these forms of universalism, if we can call them that, goes directly back to the period of, of high imperialism in the 19th century and the kind of legitimation that was developed for global rule during that uh, point. Just to give an outline, I, I have two main aims for today's lecture. The first one is to show how empires collapsed in the 20th century, while forms of imperial control remained. And I will share my screen with you just to uh, be able to document this a little bit better. If I can. Anyway, um, so in uh, 1945, this is roughly what the world looked like. Still a world of empires. Um, very much uh, forms of imperial domination, probably weakened, but still very, very significant in terms of how the world was, was set up. Um, and this is what the world more or less looks like today, at least in terms of our empires go. There's one little area that is still in dispute, as many of you know, Western Sahara. The map lies a little bit, there are other areas that are also in contention in, in issues that I would regard as imperial. But broadly speaking, uh, the world has changed very dramatically, um, while other forms of imperial control actually do remain. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the processes of imperial collapse and what that le left us with. And then secondly, I'm going to look at the US empire, first and foremost. I'm also going to look at China which might be an aspiring empire in a global sense. Uh, again, and I know this will disappoint some people, but feel free to bring this up in the discussion. I'm not going to talk all that much about Russia, um, not just because I share my LSE colleague, Barry Boussant's uh, prediction now made quite a number of years ago, but still holding through that Russia has a lot of decline in it yet, but also, um, because of what happened in the late 20th century, that Russia as an imperial power, reconstituted as the Soviet Union, um, came out of the Cold War much diminished, uh, lost about uh, 2 million square miles of territory and half its population. So it's possible that Russia as reconstituted under Putin still have imperial um, um, ideas connected to it. I think that could be argued, but much less significant than what was the case uh, in the past. Now, besides the ones I have uh, mentioned, there are other aspects of empire that survive today. Uh, one of the ones that we don't often think about is the role that empire played in creating the nation state, the concept of the nation state as the only natural form uh, of statehood, uh, in the modern world. Um, and that I think throws up a lot of, lot of questions for our own time. Um, is the time of the nation state as constituted coming out of the imperial wreckages uh, as the natural form of sovereignty, is that also coming to an end? So I will discuss that a little bit towards the end uh, of the lecture. Uh, my point here, just to give that away immediately, is that I think that pressure on the nation state today doesn't happen so much on the, uh, given the, the, the frameworks that have been developed in the late 20th century of supernatural, uh, super, uh, national institutions, uh, as we talked uh, you know, for quite some time, as from people wanting to exercise authority closer to where they live than anything that can meaningfully be called a nation. And I think we see some signs of that towards this stage of the, uh, pandemic that we are looking at in terms of decision-making. But I'll return to that towards the end 
of my talk and we can have more time um, to discuss it. But let me first turn to the changes over the last uh, 120 years and the collapse of the European empires as they had been set up in the, in the 19th century. And this happened very dramatically. You know, it happened in a much more dramatic form, I think, than most people envisage um, because of the full weight of uh, the history that developed in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it was, in many ways, uh, a form of European collective suicide through two world wars and a global depression, all of which started, at least to a high extent, in, in Europe. Um, we see here a picture from the trenches going over the top in, in, in World War I. Uh, of course, the anti-imperial resistance that I described in the past two lectures fed on this self-imposed European debasement and the, and the contradictions that came out of it uh, were able to strengthen itself, although you know, that resistance didn't originate in, in, in the European collapse. Uh, certainly the ideas uh, that Europeans were set by God or whoever to rule the world were much more difficult to uphold when you look at the carnage of the two world wars and the inability of many European countries and of the United States for that matter in the interwar period to govern uh, their own economies. Much of this critique of empire was of course also inspired by the European left and contributed to the collapse of Russia as an imperial uh, entity in the traditional European form uh, through Lenin and, and the Russian revolution. And for a while, uh, and I've written about this in, in other contexts, there was a coming together of anti-imperial resistance in colonies and semi-colonies in, in Africa and, and Asia and the Caribbean and the aims of Bolshevism, though the two parted relatively quickly when the Soviet Union under Stalin was set up as a state that looked remarkably uh, like the Russian Empire in how it imposed its control on non-European um, peoples. So out of this uh, collapse came the emergence of new states. Uh, from 1945 onwards, although most of the actual state making took place in the 1950s and, and the 1960s. And one of the big discussion points, and you will have seen these from my last lecture, is about the degree to which this particular development was necessary. I mean, was it given that the nation state in Africa and Asia was the alternative to imperial control? And a number of historians lately have been questioning this, I think for some good reasons. So my colleague, Fred Cooper um, at NYU, who I referred to earlier on, is one of those who have really emphasized this aspect of other forms of post-colonial arrangements also being in, in contention, that it would have been possible, for instance, to imagine empires reborn with different kinds of sovereignty within the same, within the same system. But it, of course, it would have to be based of some form of uh, imperial democratization, uh, which uh, very few people at the center were willing to, to give. That has been my critique and, and other people's critique of Fred Cooper's argument. Um, setting up nation states was certainly, as he argues, not a necessary outcome of imperial collapse, but it was a very likely outcome, given the history that uh, nation state making already had in Europe, and for that matter elsewhere, such as in Latin America, as the alternative to, to empire. So out of this then came this creation of new sovereign state, where nothing like it had existed before. And this is, of course, the phenomenon that the French uh, political scientist uh, Bertrand Badi calls l'état importé, the imported state, taking the state formation as it had developed over a long period of time, in the West and to some extent in, in, in Latin America and in North America and the United States and establishing it within the newly independent territories in, in Africa and, and Asia. Um, and thereby 
uh, maybe first and foremost, establishing a legal uh, framework for the nation state coming out of many of those discussions that I already referred to that existed in the late 19th century. And many of these were, of course, remarkably similar to what you found uh, within the uh, countries that these states had, had, had broken away from. Think, for instance, about the British colonies and the legal systems that were put in place. Here we have a recent picture of the Nigerian Supreme Court. And it's very hard not to draw the comparison with the origins that the Nigerian state, the former British colony, um, the origins that the judicial system had in British jurisprudence. Maybe even more important for the argument that I'm making today, or with regard to constitutions, and here we see the preamble to the Nigerian constitution very much built on the same kind of ideas. Not all of them, by the way, in terms of constitution making British, but definitely connected to a tradition that comes out of, of Britain, um, where the idea is to justify the existence of states, the existence of a build, the building up of a new form of state through a set of laws that simply declared that this state now exists and it has total sovereignty over a given territory. If you look in part three here, defining uh, what the states of Nigeria are going to be. And all of this, of course, had a tremendous impact on what the world looked like when you get to the middle part of the, of the 20th century. Um, it fed into the Cold War competition, which I have worked quite a bit on, as, as uh, Christopher mentioned, um, in a framework that to me is remarkably similar um, to many of the ideas that come out of high colonialism, high imperialism in the late 19th century. Um, and for countries outside of Europe, this emphasis on production, as you see here, uh, meant an attempt to control and regulate uh, countries in Africa and in Asia and in the Caribbean with both instruments and ideas that came out of that earlier uh, imperial um, experience. The emphasis on progress now, of course, meant, as we see in this picture, industrialization. This is from a, a, um, a, a production plant for fighter planes, I think. So industrialization meant progress. Uh, science and technology became the measure stick for success in ways that I think many um, imperialists in the late 19th century would have recognized almost immediately. Right? The same form, the same kind of ideas about what progress meant. And the complete ideologies, be it American or Soviet in the Cold War, had to be accepted. There couldn't be any kind of middle road with regard to this because of the significance of these forms of progress as postulated by what we then are used to calling the superpowers. It also emphasized, I think, within the Cold War framework that might, might meant right, that conquest could be justified by the social message that came out of that conquest or, or takeover. Um, if you insisted on progress, there was almost uh, not, no action, no uh, way forward that could not be justified uh, by that progress, by the success that there will be, particularly in industrial terms at the end of it. Whatever measures you could use against peasants, um, and against others who were skeptical to this form of rigid industrialization could and should be used because it was all in the name of progress. In many cases, um, both in Europe and outside of Europe, one developed what could be called a cult of sovereignty, um, but a sovereignty that only made sense if exercised in favor of the ruling ideology. So in other words, between states, among states, 
Sovereignty was probably more significant during the Cold War than it had been at any other point in recent history. But it was all sovereignty uh, developed and exercised under the same framework of ideological control that you'd had in terms of imperial control uh, earlier on in favor of the superpowers ideology that you, that you worked with. So the economic transformation that this gave rise to during the Cold War is to me of particular importance, not just in trying to understand how the Cold War ended, but also how we moved out of the imperial era, the era of, of, the era of imperial control and over on towards our own time through the very rapid, very dramatic economic transformation of the late 20th century. Which started as the Cold War was coming to an end in the 1970s and, and early 1980s, but then intensified, particularly through the globalization of finance capital uh, that developed very, very rapidly uh, in, in the late um, 20th century. Uh, computing technology met communications technology, ma making a uh, expansion of um, capital in general, particularly finance capital, um, much more possible than what had been the case in the past. And as I've argued before, to quite some extent, this is what undermined the Cold War as an international system, uh, that it was simply wasn't possible for the Soviet Union and its adherents to stay outside this form of development that became increasingly uh, increase, increasingly totalizing and became what in the, in the late 20th century, early 21st century, we often refer to as globalization. And here you see the development in terms of FDI, foreign uh, direct investment, the net inflows and how those have developed with some very interesting figures for this, which we'll return to later on after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, basically showing that we never quite got back to the levels before then in the over the last decade. Uh, this graph, by the way, I think shows it even more clearly because here we look at other kinds of global capital flows as well, creating a much more integrated world, um, including uh, portfolio investments and other forms of investments in, the, in, in addition to foreign direct investment. This created a, a new uh, economic format for the world. Um, uh, which quickly outgrew the Cold War framework, where the Cold War emphasized, often in a deadly form, stability. The new capitalism hated stability. Um, it wanted to see uh, change happen very, very fast. Um, there was a decrease in liquidity for banks and financial institutions and a massive increase in, in global debt, as we see from this graph here, still ongoing uh, today. So a very different world uh, from what we had seen during the Cold War. I think as an historian, the best way of looking at this when we look back at it, maybe a hundred years from now, will probably be as a period in which the Cold War was an attempt at trying to discipline and order a world that came out of the imperial wreckage, but an attempt that failed and which gave rise to the kind of unrestricted capitalism that we saw towards the end of the 20th century and the beginning, beginning of the 21st century, which is, was very hard for any kind of individual state uh, to deal with. Let me then turn to the second part of what I have to say today, which deals with the United States and other empires today. Um, um, actually, let me, before I do that, this is a graph that I think is particularly interesting when, in terms of where we have ended up in, in economic terms. Um, you saw the expansion in terms of uh, global capital exports. Here you have, was the inverse, the percentage of wages uh, within uh, GDP, in this case, US GDP. Um, but this is the same pattern that you have seen almost, almost everywhere that what people actually get out of this uh, economic expansion uh, 
in terms of the salaries and wages that they receive is actually less and less. So that connects us to the issue of the United States and understanding US political uh, power, US economic power today. And to me, uh, what we have described now in terms of developments in the 20th century is to quite some extent the story of the rise of the United States as a different kind of empire than what you've seen before. So to me, going back to Christopher's question right at the beginning, you know, there is absolutely no doubt that the United States is an empire, although it's a different kind of empire than what we've seen in the, in the past. Um, a historian colleague of, of mine uh, in, in the United States, Daniel Imabot, just wrote, wrote a book called How to Hide an Empire, which deals with the US present around the world and how it developed in the 20th century. Um, and I would go even further, I think, than what Daniel does. I, I wouldn't see the, much of the US empire as hidden at all. Uh, I think it's pretty visible. This is a map of US bases and other um, uh, points of control during the war on terror. I think this one is from 2015 or thereabouts, where you see a global framework of US control that still exists today. Uh, even as the war on terror, at least ostensibly, is being, is being reduced. This is the story of an empire, though in different forms of territorial control than what we have seen in the past. The United States still has about 800 military installations in different, in different parts of the world. It also has, and has had, I think, uh, during the Cold War and all the way up to today, a hegemonic relationship to many other countries that is reminiscent of empires of the past. It is not the same because it doesn't imply the forms of direct control that you found in empires up to the mid 20th century, but it has many of the same concepts of hegemony and how the central power actually leads than what was the case back then. What is different, at least to me, is that the US imperial project is primarily ideologically driven. Uh, even though some of these ideas, as I pointed out earlier, are connected to ideas in late imperialism in the late 19th and, and early 20th century, they've also evolved over time. And the emphasis on a liberal capitalistic universalism that the United States has stood for is singular. It's something that the United States developed through its practices and its ideas in the early part of the 20th century, but which gradually became the predominant, or one could call it the hegemonic ideology of what then was reconstituted after 1945 as the, as the Western world. Now, the big question is, in terms of the United States as an imperial project, where does that actually stand today? Are we witnessing a period of American retrenchment or even collapse? Or is the kind of framework that you look at from this picture and other similar pictures, something that's going to last into the future? So my own view, basing it on the discussion that we have now had of the 20th century, is that US global power as an empire, uh, as a central empire uh, in the post-Cold War world is not over but it has been gradually reduced in, in relative terms uh, with tremendous damage over the past few years during the, the uh, Trump presidency and to some extent in some areas even before the Trump presidency during Obama and, and Bush. There has been a gradual slide, I would argue, in terms of uh, the American international position from the early 2000s and then a rapid fall uh, during the Trump years, where all of this came home to roost and became exemplified in a way um, that we hadn't seen before, probably not since uh, the period before 1941. Um, America first, which it was said would not mean America alone, but increasingly meant that because of the way the Trump administration practiced uh, international diplomacy. Instead of being the constituting power, the hegemonic or systemic power, within a globalizing world, the United States under Trump increasingly tried to put itself on the outside 
of that international order that itself had, had created. And of course, nowhere was this uh, development better illustrated than in the neo-colonial adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan, where the United States, I think, showed with its allies um, that even when it wanted to engage in imperial behavior, it wasn't really capable of doing so because the world had changed. US power had changed, uh, the means of US power had changed, but the ability to resist and the ability to come up with other forms of ideas, some of them, as we know, exceedingly deadly, um, of how the world, at least the local world, should be organized, were much more powerful than what we had seen before. And much of this is, of course, connected to the development of military technology, um, which Professor Coker is among the world's leading, leading experts of, and we may want to discuss later on. One of the big questions now, of course, are the effects that the COVID pandemic will have uh, for the global position of the United States. And as I indicated um, to begin with, I think it will uh, affect the uh, direction that things will be taking, but probably more in terms of speeding up certain trends that were already visible um, before the COVID epidemic struck. Um, that's often the way that these kinds of uh, pandemics or natural disasters actually work. Even though a lot of people tend to think that they create a new reality of themselves, what they, re what they, what they really do is to speed up uh, trends that are already underway. And I think that will be true for the COVID pandemic as well. I think um, the United States has probably come out of this worse, at least going into it, than what many other countries did. I think many countries in Asia has come out of it relatively better. Um, it is an open question, and it would be interesting to discuss that in the Q&A session, whether the successes that the United States and Britain and a few other Western countries have had with regard to vaccination will make up for those horrific mistakes that were made in the early parts of the pandemic, at least in, uh, in terms of, of ideas and in terms of concepts of, of governance. I'm not too sure about that, but I can see how such an argument can be made. Um, some people have started to say that this was, you know, a little bit uh, like what happened during the 1970s, uh, when a lot of literature was created about US decline in the early part of the 70s. But when you get into the 1980s, the United States had yet again been able to reconstitute itself in ways that made it the winning power in the Cold War. I think one of the reasons why I'm skeptical of that uh, timeline and that discussion line now uh, has to do with the rise of China and the existence of what is increasingly becoming, at least in some areas, a peer power uh, of the United States, not in terms of military significance, not in terms of uh, global control in, in, in terms of uh, strategic uh, development, strategic thinking, but certainly in terms of how the economy has developed. And the, the three graphs that you see here, uh, so the blue one is um, um, Chinese um, uh, growth in, um, let me see if I can get this a little bit clearer. Uh, no. um, uh, in, um, in nominal terms, the, the green one is Chinese growth in PPP, um, purchasing power parity terms. And then the one on top is the development of the United States. And the main point about this graph is, of course, how remarkably quickly uh, China has been able to catch up with the United States. And I think that that is a trend uh, in economic terms that will be strengthened, at least in the short run, uh, by the pandemic and how the pandemic uh, ha has worked out. And this is not, as I'm sure everyone who listens to this lecture will know, because uh, China doesn't have problems of its own. It has uh, quite a number of them, including on governance. Uh, China is still a dictatorship. Uh, in some areas, a more unstable dictatorship than what most people think, in my view. Um, China is an empire um, that in many ways tried to behave as if it were a nation state. And we're seeing the effects of that 
in, in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in, in Hong Kong and in other areas. So there are lots of problems connected to China's growth, but in pure economic terms, and in also in terms of the development of the economic gains for fairly large numbers of the Chinese population, uh, that is pretty clear. And I think it's also a trend that is going to continue irrespective of what happens uh, within China with regard to the other challenges that the Chinese state um, uh, is facing. So China is interesting in this context because it is in many ways the most unapologetic empire uh, that has existed for some time. Even the Soviet Union, I think, had more trouble uh, in dealing with its imperial past, the imperial Russia, Russia that the Soviet, Soviet Union incorporated, than what the People's Republic of China has with incorporating into it almost all the territory of the, of the Qing Empire. But what it's trying to do is to make up for the tensions created by that imperial past by proclaiming that economic growth within the empire is for everyone. Uh, you're almost arriving now for the Chinese Communist Party uh, at an argument which says that economic growth created by them is so strong and so significant on a global scale that that overrules all the other kinds of challenges that China is facing. We will see about that in political terms. But in economic terms, I think what has been created is something that is likely to continue. So that of course brings us to one of the uh, key questions in, in, in closing of this final lecture, um, which has to be whether the uh, age of empires is over. So if we start from when we, where we started out from back in the 18th century, it would be easy to argue that empires are gone and gone forever. And in one sense, that would be right to say, in terms of territorial um, expansion. I don't think we are going to see um, empires engage in the kind of territorial expansion that we saw in the past. So when I argue that the United States and China both are empires in terms of their composition, it's different from saying that they, in a way, in terms of where they're going in the future, will, be, will behave like European empires, or for that matter, the Qing Empire, behaved in the 18th and 19th century. But in another way, I think it would be wrong or at least premature to argue that the age of empires is over. We still find many attempts at keeping global inequities in place during uh, the period that we have just seen now, for instance, the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, through the use of economic and military power. And very often that power in, is constituted in forms that are remarkably similar to what we found in the imperial past. Uh, we have also seen that exploitation and control without empire can be just as bloody as imperialism, uh, and sometimes even worse than what some forms of imperial control were. Uh, another area of Professor Coker's expertise uh, drone warfare, you can see the consequences of that in terms of how hegemony and control is exercised today. Um, the form of territorial expansion of empire that we saw in the past is probably gone forever. But that is because it doesn't matter that much in terms of the situation today. It matters for some issues, but it doesn't matter for everything. And hegemonic control very similar to what you found of the, with the use of air force by empires in the past is something that now can be exercised more cheaply and with much lesser risk uh, than what you saw uh, up to very recently. So with that in mind, and I'll, I'll finish on this, uh, on this point, what are we supposed to do in terms of dealing with this set of imperial legacies? and in terms of understanding how empire and forms of imperial control works today. To me, this is a really important question. And it's one I tried to struggle with when I've been drawing up together with my colleagues at Yale, a curriculum for a new school of global affairs that we are in the process of, of, of setting up. The one thing you can't do with empire 
is to ignore it. And I hope that during these four lectures, I've been able to deliver, uh, if not a convincing, at least a coherent argument for why it is so dangerous in terms of our intellectual enterprise for understanding global and international relations to ignore empires past and, and present. But I also think you have to go further than that. Um, I, in many ways, like the call that is coming now from many corners for decolonizing curricula of international affairs, international history, international relations. Um, only that it's very important to understand what that means. Uh, what it has to mean uh, to me is to be able to see the consequences of imperial control from other angles than from those of the imperial center, uh, and to understand the consequences, the long-term consequences that imperial control has led to for those that were subjugated and controlled. Uh, I sometimes feel that in the call for decolonizing um, curricula and reading lists and whole departments, we don't pay enough attention to that, that it's rather uh, an issue of taking things out that you may disagree with, than adding new forms of text that would broaden our understanding of empire and particularly understanding empire from below and through its consequences. I also like and welcome in many ways the debate, particularly prevalent in the United States with regard to slavery, but also something that comes up in, in Britain and in France, Belgium, Netherlands and elsewhere, about some form of restitution for victims of empire. The principle, I think, is a good one. Uh, it's just very hard to carry out uh, in practice, even though one can see many ways of doing it. For instance, by uh, giving better access to higher education for people who in the past, whose families in the past have been victims of slavery and, and colonial uh, oppression. But again, one has to do this in ways that make sense. Um, what to me doesn't make much sense is to spend an enormous amount of time and money on identifying exactly who should be compensated uh, for violence in the past. I think it's much more important to think about groups that have been disadvantaged and do what one can to try to lift those uh, groups according to the uh, individual abilities of each and every one up to the same level as more privileged groups have had. Um, I think that's an important principle, and it's one that we should spend more time on, on applying. And I think that's true both for Yale and for, for LSE. The one way one certainly shouldn't do it, if you think about it in a uh, national sense, is by uh, doing what the British government is doing at the moment, by cutting foreign aid by nearly 50%. So if there is one note that I want to end on, um, with regard to these four lectures. It is this, for all imperial powers, uh, not all of them are European, as we have seen, uh, the sense of responsibility with regard to the past must affect how we act today. If not, not only the study of history doesn't make much sense, but also our understanding of our own place in the world today becomes very hard to, to get at. And this is what I hope that universities and institutions like LSE Ideas will contribute to in the future. Not just a clearer image of where we have been and where we are today, but also to provide ideas about what we can do about inequities and problems and difficulties that have been created by our imperial costs. So I will end on that note. This has been a tremendous pleasure for me, uh, even though it has been virtual, revisiting my old uh, stomping grounds at LSE it's been a pleasure and it's also been a, a huge privilege and I will forever be grateful to LSE Ideas, to Professor Koke, Professor Olden, um, and of course to the Engelsberg Foundation that made this possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arnie. Could you um, take down your share screen so that I can... I'm trying to. ...can see you. Uh, there we go. I think, I think I'm okay now with stop sharing. There we go. Excellent, excellent. Splendid. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that lecture. And um, a number of questions have come in. Can I just ask you, start off with the usual chairman's privileges. Um, a book came out in 1973, I think, by Raymond Aron called Imperial Republic, in which he drew a distinction between the American and Soviet empires. And he said the American empire was imperial 
and the Soviet empire was imperialist. And I think what he meant by that was that the American empire was not ultimately supported by military power, but by economic uh, and, 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 and other interests uh, and levers of power. And the Soviet Union, uh, as you saw with the Brezhnev doctrine and the invasion of Czechoslovakia, couldn't allow anyone to leave its empire and would use military power to, to keep the empire in being. Do you think that distinction between imperial and imperialist is a useful one for the 21st century uh, in thinking about empires of the future or not? I think it might be. I mean, all of this, of course, depends on what, what kind of setting that you, you see it in. So Aron was, was thinking, I think, primarily about the European setting. Right? Um, and I think there he has um, uh, some really good points. I mean, you referred to Gell Understad's Empire by Invitation Thesis at the beginning, yeah, Christopher. And uh, that's one that I had tremendous sympathy for in terms of how Gell put it, which basically was that the American expansion to Western Europe was made possible by the willing uh, 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 abstention of parts of the sovereignty by European elites, at least for a while. Um, very different from uh, Soviet military occupation, military control of, of, of Eastern Europe. But if you look at the world as a whole, of course, I, I do not think that's necessarily true. If you look at East Asia, if you look at, at Latin America, Caribbean, you found that the United States was more than willing to use military force when it was needed. Uh, in order to back up its claim to a liberal, democratic, universal empire. Um, I think for today, when you compare the United States and China, uh, of course, what we have seen up to now is the United States that have been particularly willing uh, during the war on terror and its aftermath to deploy force internationally. Um, and a China that has been more reluctant in doing so. Um, I'm wondering if the United States, um, now starting perhaps with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, at least for a while, will be less willing uh, to project the use of direct force abroad. Uh, I certainly think that China is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult issue uh, in the Chinese context, um, which is not the same thing as saying that China wouldn't use force in order to gain control of uh, areas that it regards as significant to it outside its own borders in East Asia, but certainly not yet on a global scale. So, you know, if we are lucky, um, and if I'm right in what I'm talking about in terms of relative US decline, you know, at least for a while, we will be seeing fewer of these immediate interventions. But the challenge, of course, as we can see very clearly, is that uh, the United States and China has conflicting interests in some of the areas that China regards as essential to itself in Eastern Asia, Taiwan, Korea, South China Sea, uh, which opens up a whole new scenario for, for inter-great power uh, conflict, uh, which worries me a great deal. You, you said that nation states emerged out of the imperial experience. Um, one could argue, and, and some historians do, you may be one of them, you may be, disagree, that Russia was never a nation state, it was an empire. Uh, and that it is still struggling to be a nation state, that China was never a nation state, it was an empire, uh, and that it is in the process of becoming a, a nation state. Patriotic history courses are trying to build that up. I mean, what do you think of, the, of that argument, that these were basically empires that became or are in the process of becoming nation states, and not through a decolonization process, but perhaps losing imperial power in the case of Russia? Yeah, I, I think that's entirely right. I mean, I, I think, as I indicated in an earlier lecture, um, China and Russia, even today, are best understood as empires. Um, the big question for both of them, but particularly for China, is how um, the regime, whatever regime there will be, uh, will be able to use the instruments that it has at its disposal to force uh, an integration at a much higher level, including an ethnic integration, at a much higher level than what we have seen before. That within a couple of generations, uh, this idea that you know, what we now in China, the government in China calls the Han Chinese, which I simply call the Chinese, uh, are going to be predominant also in, 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 in ethnic terms. They're already more than 90% of the population. But we have to be careful with this argument. This is what my former Harvard colleague, 
Charlie Mayo is, is fond of reminding us of. Because it's so hard to draw an absolute distinction between empires and nation states. Um, think about France, for instance, the famous hexagon, right? uh, which of course, if you go back in time, was in itself an imperial project coming out from a certain part of Northern France and then expanding to what is the French nation today. Um, think about the whole discussion of a British nation, whether that exists or not, or whether Great Britain is a constellation of, of three countries or the United Kingdom of, of, of four countries. So these are difficult issues. And of course they become even more difficult when you expand this into Africa or parts of South Asia where new states were set up very recently that proclaimed themselves to be somehow nations but with very little national cohesion of any kind. So I think one has to be aware of this. I, I do think, I think you're right in saying that it's much more significant with regard to great powers such as Russia and China, but it is a phenomenon that I think it's worthwhile discussing in other contexts too. Okay. Um, one question, uh, well, the very first question actually to, to be raised today was about China's Belt and Road uh, initiative mm. and whether this can be seen as an imperial project. And I'd like to ask you about that. I mean, you could see if you believe in the idea of debt entrapment, whether it's direct, indirect, intended or unintended, is a kind of imperial control, I suppose. But there, I wanted to ask you uh, another question today, uh, an article that was published quite recently by someone you might know, because he's professor of the law school at the uh, at Peking University, uh, Jing, uh, Xing Gong. Mm -hmm who wrote that the history of humanity, I'm quoting him here, is the history of imperial hegemony and empires have changed from local to global. Today, there is a single world empire, which he calls the American liberal rules based empire. Tomorrow, he said, China will take over uh, and become that single model um, because the American why is defective. It promotes economic inequality, ineffective government, which is democracy, decadence, cultural liberalism, elitism, wokeism, these are the things that he identified in his article. And he's saying that unlike the American empire, there'll be no civilizing mission. There will be uh, no uh, value uh, system that will be imposed, but there will be a power structure, <laughs> which is going to be the reality of the 21st century. So ultimately China will be taking the decisions on everyone's behalf in a constructive and positive manner, of course. Uh, so what do you make of the Belt and Road Initiative, of this idea of uh, power shifts and of, the United, uh, and of China becoming a different, uh, a different kind of imperial project and its power being different from the power levers that we associate with American empire in the latter half of the 20th century? Yeah, those, are, those are critical questions. Uh, I spent some time two years ago before our current predicament set in at, at Tsinghua in Beijing discussing with him and others uh, these ideas about um, a Chinese, a special Chinese road to international control where it would exercise uh, its influence in a different way than any other empire has done in the past. But let me just uh, remark, uh, make a couple of remarks about uh, Belt and Road first. So to me, Belt and Road first and foremost comes out of the needs of uh, Chinese capital itself. So, I mean, and that's not very hard to understand. I and mean, this is uh, to create outlets for Chinese exports, for Chinese companies that want to find markets abroad. Um, and at the same time, of course, from a government perspective, to try to use that economic expansion more deliberately than what China has done in the past uh, in order to uh, uh, enhance Chinese power, first and foremost over its neighbors, but also eventually uh, further afield. So in that sense, it is a kind of imperial uh, project, but maybe more sort of late imperial in a way, um, or the 20th century than, 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 than 19th century. Um, I have, and I think a number of, of uh, people who do a lot of work on China are somewhat doubtful about uh, what this is going to end up in. Uh, I think um, some of it will end in tears. I think there is an increasing resistance within China with regard to some of these uh, initiatives, where the idea, uh, the, the criticism that comes up is that, uh, you know, uh, there are many areas within China uh, 
that are in need of further development as well. Uh, very poor areas uh, in the western and central regions of China. Why on earth should this development be taken overseas before you actually look at China's own, uh, own needs? Uh, and there are other people who are saying, you know, a lot of this is simply about corruption. It's about money going to people who are not deserving of it. And the, the actual benefit for China in economic terms is, is relatively limited. So I think there are discussions about this that often are not picked up in the West. Uh, there, is, there are disagreements about it. As long as Xi Jinping remains in power, I think it is going to be the overall uh, way forward, the overall development um, set by the Chinese government. But after that, I'm not so sure. On this issue of what kind of power uh, China is going to be, I think a number of Chinese intellectuals have come up with various schemes, including people who are actually relatively skeptical of some of the direction that the Chinese government is going in the moment, which will see China as a much more benign international power than what imperial powers have been in the, in the past. Of course, they would deny that China is an imperial power at all. What some of them talk about is this concept of Tianxia, all under heaven, um, which is a, an old uh, Confucian concept for uh, how uh, China's uh, glorious civilization and, 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 and culture radiates outwards from China um, and becomes uh, a benefit for, for people in a, in, a, in a global sense, at least those who are culturally capable of picking up the civilizational values of these forms of teaching. And what these people then try to do is to apply some of the same in terms of China's thinking about international rules and regulations in the 21st century. To me, that comparison is rather, it's, there are some things to it, but it's, it's very, very hard to use as a starting point for discussion about what China is trying to do today. And it becomes more of a slogan than, than any form of actual practice. So I think that when China does come of age internationally, the big question is, what is it that China really wants to do, except to have more for China? And I think this is the problem that we are facing at the moment. Um, uh, many Chinese intellectuals are pretty good at, at criticizing the United States. They're almost as good as the Americans are at criticizing themselves. Uh, but they are not particularly good in coming up with an alternative as to what kind of power China will be when it has risen. And I must say that the kind of examples that you see more recently in terms of Chinese behavior towards its neighbors under Xi Jinping does not bode well uh, for what the future is going to bring uh, with regard to this. That seems to me to be a, a very hard line, very tough policy based on China's very narrow concepts of self-interest rather than this global Tianxia inclusive cultural uh, form of contribution that some people are talking about in Beijing today. And also keeping on the global theme, another question uh, about the Hart and Negri thesis about globalization in the 1990s being a form of empire. So there's two questions that emerge from that. Uh, one, can forces be imperial uh, as opposed to states? Uh, and secondly, if you're thinking of uh, how empire disintegrates because of revolts, colonial revolts and nationalism, I suppose you could say there was a revolt against globalization, but it was actually within the Western world, uh, Brexit, uh, five star movement in Italy, populism, etc. That actually, if globalization was the Western imperial project indirectly, um, that it wasn't a great success and created the same uh, forces that you identified at the beginning of the 20th century. Yes, I mean, both of those are really good questions. And um, I think with regard to Hart and Negri, what I would say, is that it does make sense, and, and their work testified to this, um, that you can talk about uh, imperial formations and even imperial functions, possibly operations, uh, without there necessarily being one imperial power that is at the core of this. But one has to be careful, and this is my critique of their position in taking this so far, that you do not actually recognize the state interests that are at the bottom of this, even when they appear very, very clearly. So I've explained, I think, in my talk today, how I think that works for the United States. I think it also works to quite some extent for China, uh, even though there is much less emphasis on this in terms of how the leadership, the Chinese Communist Party leadership is integrated into a particular form of Chinese capitalism, 
uh, that works both within China, but also overseas, and that works within this framework of globalization indeed is a, a, a fundamental part of it. And I think it is important to, to, to understand that and to, to be able to cover both of these. This idea that you sometimes find in Western salons of various sorts, that you can talk about imperialism, you can talk about settler colonialism, but you do so separate from actually discussing politics and policy and how these powers that, that e exploit and explore these forms of, of imperial rule actually arrive at them. So that would be my, um, my view on, on that. The second one is also really interesting. And there I think there is a point that is often overlooked. So I do see both uh, what you find in some European countries, you find it in France, you find it in Italy, you certainly find it in the, in the UK with Brexit. You find it in the United States with Trump. You find it in, in China, in some of the um, hard to express nationalist criticism of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party for not taking the core values of the Chinese people seriously enough. I mean, in other words, not being nationalist enough. It seems strange for us who often think about the current Chinese leadership as the most nationalist ever. I'm among them. Uh, to hear that kind of criticism. But, it, but, but you do find it uh, in China in ways that to me echoes a little bit of the ideas that come out of, of Europe, Britain and the United States. And I have a suspicion that some of these might actually be strengthened by the way the pandemic has played out. This idea that if you look at this on a global scale uh, from the outbreak of the pandemic, that you stood a much better chance of saving yourselves and your families if you had a, a responsible government that was close to you, uh, that operated within your neighborhood and could take decisions there in order to uh, prevent the, the, the pandemic from spreading, than if you had governments uh, and decisions being made very far away. Now, we are still not in a position to see how this plays itself out. Maybe with regard to vaccinations and the development of vaccines especially, this argument could be turned around and say that it's only a strong centralized, even federal state that is capable of this kind of, of, of science miracle that, that these uh, vaccines really are. But so far, I think the jury is still out on the latter. While on the former, we are already seeing quite a number of uh, political movements and political initiatives moving in that direction. So for those who are saying, you know, we cannot count Brexit and Trump under uh, a form of resistance to um, imperial rule in a broader sense. I would say, think again. I mean, you know, it, it's not given that you would politically like, at least in my case, uh, everything that goes together in terms of the development that we are seeing at the same time. So not, not all good things happen uh, simultaneously. Not all bad things happen simultaneously or for the same reasons. So I think we should be brave enough to say that some of the directions that we have seen um, expressed by Brexit, expressed by Trump, expressed by some Democrats in the United States as well, of saying that we need to put government and governance closer to where people are, closer to the kind of issues that, that people actually are preoccupied with, you know, that that also comes out of this process of breakdown of, of empires that are discussed in this in this talk. Uh, here's a very um, direct question. Is the European Union an empire? I don't think so. Um, and I think we are seeing right now some of the results of it not being an empire. Empires, as I explained in the first lecture, have the wherewithal, the power, uh, and the ideological political instincts um, to act very decisively in terms of crisis. That's indeed how they survive in being empires. Empires who do not do that uh, generally get a very short lifespan. Uh, I don't think the EU is gonna have a very short lifespan. Uh, even if it's not able um, to act as empires do with regard to these kinds of issues. For instance, as we have seen now with regard to the pandemic, but also with regard to a host of economic and social questions, not to mention foreign policy questions that have come up where the EU both collectively and in terms of individual states uh, have stumbled. 
But that's because the EU is not there to serve as an imperial power. The EU is there in order to facilitate interaction and integration between states that still regard themselves very much as sovereign. And I think that balance point between existing sovereignty at the state level and uh, forms of uh, uh, integration, coordination, give off some of the power of the state, um, first and foremost, to, to, to create economic development, as we've seen in Eastern Europe, I mean, Southern Europe on a remarkable scale, but also to lead more long-term to individual countries being able to do more, for instance, in terms of science and technology. Think about the European Research Council and the tremendous uh, results that have come out of that. So no, I would not say that the EU is an imperial power, but even though it has some of the traits of, of empire, as I, as I pointed out earlier on, um, I do think, however, going back to the last question, that some of the skepticism and some of the resistance against the EU uh, is linked to concepts of resistance against empire and, 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 and forms of control that these people see in many ways as being similar to uh, what was exercised at the imperial level in the past. So one has to be open for seeing that, I think, but at the same time, analytically be capable of saying, no, I mean, the EU is not an empire in, in any meaningful sense of the term. Here's a, a tricky exam question. Um, do you only know th what an empire is or that you're part of an empire when it breaks up? Uh, were people aware that Ireland was part of an imperial project until Ireland became independent? Uh, that's a really good one. Discuss. Yeah, I think, um, I think it depends. So, I mean, if you are at the sharp end of imperial expansion and has been so recently, which was indeed the case, in a lot of different places in the world at the beginning of the 20th century, then you know that you live in an empire uh, because you know, your rights are not looked after, you're not represented, um, you are economically, financially deficient in ways that people at, this, at the center of the empire so obviously are not. And when you get that, as you got in the Soviet Union, uh, demonstrated through radio and TV, you know, then it's pretty clear, yeah, you live, you live in, 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 in some form of, of empire. Um, it's much harder, of course, um, when a process of integration has been taking place over a very long period of time. So one of the cases that I teach um, at the Jackson School at Yale is a case that it's set in roughly 200 BC uh, under the Han Emperor Wu, which deals with China's expansion into what is today southern China, to China south of the Yangtze river, uh, which was then mainly, not exclusively, but mainly uh, a proto-Viet speaking area. So the same language that has developed into modern Vietnamese, or at least the elites were connected to that culture. Um, and would certainly not identify themselves as Chinese in any meaningful sense of the word. Now, after 2000 years of imperial control, of course, they are very much Chinese. You can ask a person in Guangdong or Guangxi or Fujian, you know, in southern China, whether they're Chinese, and they will look at you and shake their head and say, you know, another stupid foreigner who comes in and asks strange questions, right? Um, so how long a period of imperial control lasts is directly connected to how people see themselves um, with regard to identity, uh, including ethnic identity. Uh, France, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, within the hexagon is, a, is another is another really, really good example. So time plays a very important role in this. Integration plays an important role in it. My sense is always at the end of the day that it comes down to politics. If people think that they are better served by having other arrangements, uh, another arrangement, an imperial arrangement, they would generally fight for it. And some, in some cases be willing to, to die for it. Um, but if they think that they now belong in a broader sense, to what this empire has created. Well, then their identity would be primarily imperial, even if they wouldn't necessarily themselves recognize it as such. A question about um, delaying action, I suppose, of the Western powers after they'd lost formal empire. Um, you didn't mention neocolonialism as a concept in the 50s and 60s, cultural imperialism, which was, I think, started in the 1970s as, as a concept that became familiar. I would add to that uh, 
soft power mm. as a form of, of, of imperial influence, at least if not imperial control. Could you say something about neocolonialism, cultural imperialism, soft power, mm. generally? Yeah, so I think this is where it becomes difficult. I mean, it's a little bit like the Hawk Negri discussion that we already had. Um, how you can take on board the concerns that are there with regard to development of development of these terms, but at the same time to be very careful uh, with saying that this is necessarily a part of the same phenomenon or or, or intimately connected um, to the same kind of developments that we have seen in trying to set up a narrower concept, more instrumental and therefore in many ways more useful concept of what empire imperialism and colonialism actually is. So let's take neocolonialism, which is a very good example of this. So the critique of neocolonialism has developed during the 1960s, which basically says that, yeah, you know, countries may be decolonized, they may have got their own government and broken free of the empire, but they're still under the total economic control uh, of this particular uh, country, mainly in most cases, the home country that they, they broke away from or the imperial country that they broke away from. Of course, in many cases is essentially true. You know, I mean, that form of imperial control continued. Is that essentially different from the forms of imperial control that existed prior to the dissolution of the empires? I'm not so sure about that. Uh, what is neo about it is, of course, that it continues after the breakdown of the formal empire. So that's the reason why I'm a bit skeptical of using that particular concept. But if people want to use it for political reasons, I have no trouble with it. Um, cultural imperialism is trickier because there are so many things that tend to fall under the highlight of cultural imperialism that almost anything that you dislike uh, can be pointed to as a product coming in from elsewhere and polluting you know, the kind of, of, of cultural or, or ethnic purity that you envisage for your own, your own area. Uh, it is true, of course, that the United States, in a hegemonic sense, has been particularly good at exporting parts of, of, of its culture, if I may call it that, overseas. And that's, of course, what, what my former colleague Joe and I had in mind, at least in part, when he developed the concept of soft power as well. But that's further from my concept of, of empire and, and, and imperialism. And I think if you spend too much time dealing with that as an integral part of the concept of empire, you actually develop away from uh, what to me at least is some of the more core understandings of the power relationships that are built into this. There's a, a book uh, you will remember came out, I think last year by Reggie Debray, a great critic of empire in his day called How We All Became Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I thought was he was a little late in the day to publish a book with that title. <laughs> but, you know, we've all been Disneyfied. Uh, we all listen to American music. We all go to Hollywood movies, etc. So in a sense, America has triumphed. I and mean, that's his argument through cultural imperialism. No, and uh, this, is a, this is an interesting point, though, because, you know, much of this, e even if we think about Europe and, and Britain, would not have been possible if it hadn't been for the tremendous projection of American economic, military, political power that went before. So uh, what many people miss, I think, with regard to this, though you and I, Christopher, have worked on this in, in slightly different form, is of course how the American presence in Europe transformed the continent in the latter half of the 20th century in ways that many young Europeans today do not quite understand because they do not have that link to their own past which is a very different form of society. And not just in terms of drinking Coca-Cola and listening to rap music, but in terms of how societies were constituted in Britain as well. I mean, Britain has become a very different kind of society from what it was before under American influence. But would this have happened if it weren't for the rise of the United States in a broader sense in, in the middle part of the 20th century? I, I very much doubt it. Mm. Uh, this is a Cold War question, but um, I'm going to slip it in as you're a Cold War historian, and it's about the partition of India in 1947. And the, the question is, um, was it in a sense a British plan to make sure that there was a base in northern India, i.e. Pakistan, that could be utilized in the Cold War, uh, coming Cold War against Russia? 
I mean, it kind of goes back to the idea, I suppose, of the martial races, Pakistan, the British seeing the, this difference in Pakistan, of course, having been unqualified, or rather the Muslims having been supportive of the British during the Second World War, uh, as opposed to Gandhi, et cetera, quit India movement and all of that. But anyway, and that's a historical question for you. Well, there are people, not least at LSE, who can answer this question much, much better than, than what I can, uh, and historians of India of whom there are many in, 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 uh, in the UK and at British institutions, will be able to answer this much better. But my sense is that it was, even though it was not the driving force behind what, in my view, was a disastrous partition of India uh, as the colonial uh, era came to a close, it did play a role in terms of thinking about border areas, uh, both from the perspective of Britain, but also very soon uh, as we get into the period of immediate decolonization, uh, the United States. Um, and of course, if we look at what has happened since then, you, you see all the reasons why that was the case uh, because of, of uh, Western Pakistan, to some extent also the Eastern parts of Pakistan uh, in, in the original conceptualization of the, of the country, the significance that these areas have strategically. So I think to put it bluntly, I think that one, by setting this as the main reason for the creation of uh, an Islamic state uh, out of parts of colonial Indian territory, uh, you know, setting that as a driving force, uh, I think one would be pretty close to the conspir conspiracy theory uh, field, and I don't want to go there. But that's not the same mm -hmm. thing as saying mm -hmm. that these kinds of thinking uh, in terms of being one part of the justification for acting the way, way one did, in the longer perspective, did play a role. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be an expert on Pakistani history to see that very, very early in, in the development of, uh, of, of Pakistan in terms of the links that were created uh, to Britain, but also to a very high extent to the United States. So this could be, in a, in a, in a sense, uh, part of a, a broader question is that thesis put forward by Derek Liebart, for example, uh, who came and gave a, a book launch here about how Bevan and others, the Labour government, tried to revitalise the British Empire uh, to keep the UK as the third superpower, uh, who all, of course, uh, fell apart, particularly in the Middle East uh, by, by the mid-50s. But there was this idea that the empire could actually be uh, revitalised yeah. um, given a final uh, lease of life. And, uh, you may not want to comment on that, uh, Arnie. I mean, we're, we're running out of time, and I, there was a question that I would like you to, to raise, sure. because it's been uh, asked here, and it was raised in an article by Rana Mitter quite recently, about the alarming influence of Carl Schmitt uh, in Chinese circles, this European 20th century intellectual, not Karl Marx, the 19th century European intellectual, the idea of enemies and the idea that you have friends and enemies and there's absolutely nothing in between. Everyone has to make choices in a sense. And it goes back to the another, uh, I think, influential uh, person, uh, Liu Shixin and his uh, trilogy. And I know he's quite close to uh, people in the Politburo uh, uh, and, and very supportive of the government with this idea that in the universe, there are clashing civilizations and imperial projects. And that basically the world is a hostile place. Uh, and that's a, that's a rather negative view of the future, particularly if the world has to come together to solve climate change and everything else. And we've left it extremely late, possibly too late on that particular, in that particular area. So this is a final question for you, which takes you slightly away from, from your theme today. But to what extent is this kind of antagonistic view of politics gaining traction in China? Uh, that there are enemies out there and it's a struggle and it's really zero sum because your success will always be at the expense of someone else. Mm. But those are in a way two good questions to end up with Christopher. I mean just very briefly on the on the first one about the possibilities for a reconstitution, a democratic or liberal or social democratic uh, empire um, after the Second World War. So I think both in Britain and in France and to a lesser ex extent in, in, in the Netherlands, you found this kind of idea. And it's true that this was an idea that was not just held, at least to begin with, this is Fred Cooper's argument, by people at the Imperial Center, uh, people like Bevan and others. Um, but it was also held by a fairly large number of elite figures 
in the colonies who themselves were linked up to imperial institutions for reasons that they saw as being really good reasons, not just for themselves, but also for the, for the countries and for the territories that they represented. The reason for me why this did not succeed is mainly that the idea of a nation state being the only form of logical outcome after imperial collapses was already so strongly set, not least by Europeans themselves back in the 19th century or by Latin Americans, or indeed by the outcome in Europe after the First World War, that it was very hard to convince people, even people who ideally wanted to keep empires together, uh, that some kind of democratization would be preferable over independence, which of course has led, and this brings us back to the issue of, 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 of the integration of Europe within the European Union, to a lot of people now, for instance, um, uh, in, in, in Western Africa or in Northern Africa, asking themselves, you know, in today's situation, why on earth it's possible that many young people in France think that, you know, they are, they, they are closer to, to Croatia within the European Union than what they are to Mali or to Algeria that had been connected to France for a very, very long time. And now those, you know, it's, it's correct that it's a good idea to think about those kinds of questions and not just take the development as it happened for granted. On China, so I'm struck by the same thing. Um, I wrote a review last week in Foreign Affairs of Bill Hayton's excellent new book about the idea of China, what China actually is. Well, one of the points I made was that there is something strikingly negative, almost nihilistic, about some of the Chinese approach to the injustices that have befallen China in the past. And some of it links to the discussion of empire that we have had over the past four lectures. And the argument goes a little bit like this. Not everyone holds this, but, but some people do. That the basic injustice in today's international system is that the West for 500 years was able to take over whole continents elsewhere, exterminate peoples who were there, replace them with their own people, uh, and create a world that was, in, in fact, for mo in most respects, a Western world. Well, China did nothing of this. Right? China was excluded from that kind of process. Um, and therefore, for Western countries now to sit down and say, well, the world is what it is, meaning the way we created this, it's seen, therefore, as being blatantly unfair in this very long but often adopted Chinese view of, of how the world has developed. Now, some of this is, is true, uh, and it's particularly relevant, I think, for many Chinese when you think about how Chinese people were kept out of many of these countries through exclusion acts of various sorts. But it doesn't deliver a good Chinese foreign policy or international policy today. So complaints about the past, uh, if they become the center of the kind of policy you want to develop, uh, can almost never develop uh, you know, a good strategy for how you wanna, wanna go forward. What the Chinese leadership ought to do when it looks at this imperial history is to tell itself, okay, what we want to create, not least with regard to our neighbors, is something that is fundamentally different from this kind of expansion control uh, and, and extermination. Uh, we want to create a more inclusive, more coherent, more cooperative form of relationship when we are in charge. The problem is that there is absolutely no sign, except in terms of declarations, that the Chinese leadership is willing to do that. So in that sense, I think the whole international situation that we are facing now is very much, although unfortunately in a very negative way, a product of the past that we've been discussing in these lectures. Well, that's a great note, I think, um, a sobering note on, on which to end. Um, Arnie informed us just before he came on air that his uh, period of isolation, he came in from the United States, should have ended during his talk, and therefore he can be released back into the community, as we say, and possibly can go to the, the pub next door for a well-earned drink. With all dangers that this, this has for, for the country, yes, I, I think that uh, the my time of release has actually come. You might become a person of interest in due course. Um, thank you very much, Arnie, for the lecture today uh, and for the four lectures, uh, which will appear as a book uh, eventually. Uh, and um, I just want to let you know that our next Engelsberg lecturer will be Margaret Macmillan.
and we'll be talking about alliances, coalitions, and how they fight wars. But let me just say that it's been an intellectual feast for the last couple of months listening, listening to your lectures, Arnie. Thank you so much for coming today. And I look forward to seeing some of you next year for Margaret Macmillan's lectures. Goodbye. <laughs>